Hello, hello. Uh, before I get the stream started, uh, I, have, I, I I just grabbed myself a quick lunch because I lost track of time. So I'm going to put it on the title screen and mute, and I'll be back in a couple minutes. All right, full of corn dog, ready to go. From my understanding, um, the excuse me, the itch page on this game says it's forty nine thousand words, which is helpful. Helps me gauge how long it'll be, which means this will probably be two streams. The uh, general guide says that that's something like six hours of reading aloud. So let's get started. And I finally figured out how to how to pronounce this. It's cachexia because it's a medical term. It is the degradation of muscles, um, but not fat. So it, it happens to like people go undergoing cancer therapies, where they'll start losing weight and getting really weak, you know. Um, but yeah, it's so it causes weakness, lethargy, uh, unsafe weight loss, etc. But you'll excuse me for not having known the term before. Burping as quietly as possible. Lonely. Strangely lonely. Those words surfaced in her mind as she gazed up toward the towering trees, their branches extending forever in all directions. The corn dogs extending in all directions. They made her feel so small and insignificant, like a frail leaf on the wind at the mercy of wherever it took her. Lonely. There was no other way to describe this place.
Just a little while earlier, she'd stepped out of her hired carriage, leaving the main road to explore these woods. That's a little loud. Yeah, that looks better. Esther's driver had warned her that the forest has, was seldom visited. If she ran out of supplies, she'd have to walk back on to the road on foot and hope to flag down a stagecoach heading to the city. And that forest is haunted, girl. Dangerous for anybody, let alone someone with the pail. I wouldn't head in there if I were you. I'm saying as it's almost evening, I'll take you back to town for free. But she refused the driver's offer, turning away from her last hope. It was impossible. The decision would haunt her forever, a hanging mystery of what she might have discovered. No matter how isolated or helpless these vast woods made her feel, she promised herself she wouldn't leave without answers. A light breeze brushed past Esther's cheeks. It carried the fragile scent of spring through a lingering wintry chill still blanketed the forest. Spring always made her symptoms worse, somehow. As everything gathered its energy to bloom and flower, her lethargy only seemed to become deeper and darker. The more vibrant Esther's surroundings grew, the more she felt her energy draining away. Well, if she could notice a change in how the seasons affect her, like, it must not be that life-threatening. Like, to have a frame of reference of at least a year, if not multiple, with the disease. Like, it could be worse. Some days she barely had the strength to even move. It could be worse! And yet she couldn't bring herself to hate the season. It hardly seemed fair to be angry at the word for, world for turning its cycles, for life continuing on around here just like it always had. Even now, she still remembered when spring was her favorite, very favorite time of all. Esther suddenly came to a halt. She felt a strange sensation under her boot as she stepped on something just now. Bending down, she curiously patted the forest floor, searching for whatever it was. After a moment, her fingers brushed something small and cold. A key. Was, what was a key doing out here in the middle of nowhere? Puzzled, Esther turned the tiny shimmering piece of metal over in her palm. No marks, symbols, or engravings. It could have belonged to anyone or anything. It probably belonged to a person. After a long moment, she slowly rose back to her feet, slipping the key into her skirt pocket. It's got pockets! Perhaps it was a good omen. She'd always had a hard time with superstition or questions of fate, preferring the calm logic of cause and effect to anything unseen. But these days, as the world's realities grew, seemed to grow ever bleaker, Esther found herself hoping for something more. It didn't really matter whether things like omens or destiny were actually real, as long as they made life a little less unforgiving. With a small flicker of hope in her heart, Esther turned to carry on once more. She had no map, no directions, and almost no clue as to what she was searching for. Only the faintest trail of a possible cure. Maybe leave finding the cure to people who don't have the disease, like pe more able-bodied people. Set up a fun, try a ribbon. As the hours passed by, all sense of time was devoured by a sea of unending trees. The forest streaming springtime varnish faded to a ghostly gloom, the cheery bird song replaced by rustling crickets and distant ominous howls. A painful sting suddenly shot across Esther's arm. He yanked her out of her absent-minded wandering, back to the oppressive emptiness of the forest. After a moment, she realized she'd walked too close to the brambles. Warm droplets oozed down her wrist, an uncomfortable reminder to always watch her step. As Esther gazed down at the small, welling beads of blood on her flesh, her surprise began to shift into a sense of gnawing doubt. Perhaps she really had gone too far after all. If there really was anything or anyone within these woods, she should have stumbled across it by now. And if the rumors were false, just another folk tale made of empty hope, spinning more empty hope in a vicious cycle. 
Was this all was all of this nothing but a dead end? Had her whole journey been pointless? Well, let's wrap it up, guys. Roll credits. Would she have to tell them she'd failed? Idiot. Esther muddled al muttered aloud, struck by a sudden sense of self-loathing. Those harsh thoughts could be dealt with later, but she couldn't keep stumbling through the darkness so pointlessly. Failure or not, it didn't change where she was now. She had to flint and steel in her satchel, along with a little water and rations. If she gathered some loose branches, at least she could make a fire to keep warm. It wasn't the first night Esther had spent alone in the middle of nowhere, and it surely wouldn't be the last. Again, if you got strength enough to, like, do survival things, it could be a lot worse. Slowly, cautiously, she crept through the, cr the thick underbrush. The moon's faint glow offered enough light for Esther to find a few branches long and dense enough for a campfire. But every time she crouched down to forage, her fingers searching through the cold, damp earth, it felt as like someone was breathing right behind her ear. Esther shook off a ghostly sensation with a deep shudder. Hi, Esther. Can I hold your hand? It was just the old rumor she'd heard. They were finally getting under her skin. Foolish tales of primeval spirits guarding the forest, devouring the soul of anyone who ventured too deep. Deeply. Of course, Esther never gave any credence to those stories. Nor would anybody with common sense, for that matter. Ghosts simply didn't exist. Still, the sooner she had a fire, the better. Oh, she's got the ligma. At last, Esther spotted a clearing just beyond the trees. With a bundle of sharp branches carried in her, cradled in her arms, she hurried out into the open, anxious to finally set up camp. But as she stepped into the glade and the shadow, shadows gave way to shapes, she froze. Ah, it's a woodland mansion. Go in there, you'll get the totem of reviving. There, right in front of her eyes. A beautiful aged house rose amidst the darkness. It stood like an elusive mirage in the desert. Too perfect and out of place to be true. Was it an illusion, uh, Esther thought, after her sixth ellipses of the day? Or, by some miracle, had she actually found the apothecary's estate? But surely the place was abandoned. It gave off an atmosphere far too lonely and desolate to be inhabited. Esther could barely discern any of its features, so thick were the shadows that shrouded the house's mountainous shape. A thick swirling mist consumed the earth around its foundation, sweeping across the ground like some poisonous cloud searching for intruders. Like its very presence was waiting to reject her. This had to be it. A place that had evaded all maps. And yet she'd simply stumbled upon it. Something about that idea made a sense of deep apprehension crawled down her spine. Hey, Courtney, I like spines! In a trance between fear and fascination, she found herself moving across the clearing, towards the manor entrance. Do you prefer toward or towards? Really, they mean the same thing. One just has an S on it. The pale mist seeped around Esther's boots, swallowing her footsteps one by one, as opposed to two by two. It felt like entering a dream as if she were slowly crossing the threshold into a different reality. Sometimes you just need to add a little spice to sentences, so you add things like one by one. What does that mean? Really nothing. It means in sequence, I guess. But in this case, of course it was. It didn't swallow the footsteps that you hadn't taken, or the ones that you took before. So, of course it was in sequence. You don't need to say that. But it does sound good to say it to people who aren't keenly aware of these uh, of these techniques. It's not bad writing, of course. It's just it makes the English major in me giggle. It felt, and I, I'm certainly guilty of it too. It felt like entering a dream, as if she were slowly crossing the threshold into a different reality. You can practically put one by one anywhere, really. Until she realized that her fingertips were suddenly brushing cold metal, one by one. The handles for those foreboding doors loosely grasped beneath her uncertain, trembling palms. Her 
Grammatically speaking, I prefer toward. However, adding the S has become standard. That's funky how that kind of thing works. When you have a language with no central authority, it's like, what's correct? Well, whatever feels correct. Please. Amanda, please. The soft, nearly inaudible word left her lips like a whispered prayer. Amanda, please. Slowly, gingerly, the handles begin to turn. Until, with a softly beckoning creak, the doors yawned open to allow Esther within. You said the the Y word, and now I'm gonna. Oh, this door is huh? Said the verboten thing. Inside the house, the scent of musty aged wood greeted her from the darkness. Just barely, Esther could make out the shape of a stairwell, illuminated by rays of moonlight. Something about it compelled her, or perhaps it was simply less frightening than exploring past the pitch black archway ahead. After a hesitant pause, she closed the doors behind her. The wind had started howling faintly, casting an eerie echo through the manor square. And now the answer had me a bit infected. Slowly, Esther crept up the stairs, wincing at the small creaks that followed her movements. Oh, jeez. Oh, no. Oh, shucks. The second floor held a number of rooms, their doors all ominously closed. The doors playfully closed. The doors ordinarily closed. The doors boringly closed. On a nervous whim, Esther decided to reach for the second door on the right, inching it open with bated breath. Oh my god, the vacant room was a study. As her eyes drifted around the dark space, she could see rows of shelves stuffed with books, a cluttered desk, tables full of dusty alchemy equipment. A study. Esther's heart leapt in her chest. Even though the apothecary was no longer here, what if they'd left some of their research behind? With the light of day, she could come through these books and papers. Surely there had to be something of use in them. Maybe, just maybe, she had finally found a glimmer of hope to cling on to. I found it. I found it, yeah. Ugh. Allowing herself a heavy sigh of relief, Esther closed the door behind her and stepped towards the small cot nearby. Towards count three! Cold as it was, at least she'd have a roof over her head and a bed to spend the night on. As if on cue, she felt a wave of exhaustion blanketing her mind. Maybe it was time to take her medicine and sleep. Even a few hours would be enough. Was that a creak? Esther... Esther froze, every inch of her body suddenly petrified. Creak! Creak. Creak. Something was right outside the door. A chilling tightness gripped Esther's chest. She couldn't breathe. Every instinct in her body told her to stay utterly silent. Don't let it sense you. Don't get caught. Don't move. Don't. Without warning, the door burst open. Yahoo! She had no choice but to look and see. Ah! Eh. Not a monster or a ghost. Only a young girl, trembling in obvious fright. You're... Who are you? Her fright slowly fading, the girl stared wide-eyed at Esther, still shaking a little. She'd probably been expecting to see a ghost, too. And they ended up scaring each other equally. Gosh, shucks, no ghosts. I'm Esther. Esther, that's your name. My name sucks. Esther nodded. And you're real. This isn't a dream, is it? No, I don't think so. Hmm. <laughs> An awkward silence followed their strange conversation. Esther found herself wondering if maybe this actually was his dream after all. Really, it seemed almost it almost seemed too surreal to be anything else. After a long few moments, the girl's expression began to soften. 
She took a small hesitant step towards Aster. She took a large hesitant step. She took a small confident step. And uh, then another, then another. I can't believe it. Another person came here. A real girl right in front of me. Oh, don't say it like that. This is so exciting. Those eyes are a little too detailed. I feel like they're gonna blink asynchronously and go... <coughs> Baffled, Esther gazed down at the delighted, warm face beaming up at her. My name's Sena. I'm so happy to meet you, Esther. I was getting a drink from the well, so I didn't see or hear you come in. You must have thought the house was empty, right? I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, but I... Well... Sena let out a small, nervous laugh, toying with the ribbons on her dress. You're the first person I've seen in six years. I've never expected someone uh, to find someone else inside the house, especially not in this room. Had Esther heard her right. Sena had been living alone for six years. Was it possible that she was the apothecary the rumors talked about? Oh! You haven't eaten yet, have you, Esther? You look so tired and hungry. Here, fatten up. Get nice and fat while I preheat the oven. Gasping softly, Sena reached out to clasp Esper's hand between her tiny palms. I'll light the fireplace, and you can go get warm while I make some supper. That sounds nice, right? Come, let's go downstairs. All right. Taken aback by Sena's eager offer, Esther hesitantly nodded. Esther adverbly nodded. Even though she wanted to ask what Sena knew about the cure, her stomach rumbled noisily at the thought of a warm dinner. Alright, the adjectives and adverbs are getting to be a bit much. It wouldn't hurt to wait until they'd eaten, surely. Too many adverbs is like too much salt. All you taste is the salt. The metaphor works beyond the fact that an oversalted dish is ruined, because an oversalted dish just tastes like salt instead of what you wanted it to taste like. An overadjectived story only tastes like adjectives, as it were. Moreover, the reason you use salt is to make food taste more like itself, because we don't have any other better word for it, really. Similarly, adjectives may make a story feel more like itself. Still holding Esther's hand, Santa led her back downstairs and into the parlor. As soon as she'd stuffed some wood into the fireplace and set it alight, the darkness suddenly lifted. Melting into a cozy warmth thanks to the fire's cheerful crackling. Jesus Christ. Suddenly lifted. Cozy warmth. Cheerful crackling. And a one. And a two. And a three. Before she really knew what was happening, Esther found herself wrapped up in a pile of blankets, sitting on the couch before the hearth. It really puts the hearth in hearth and home. Sena seemed like a little blur of happy energy, fussing over Esther one moment, then hurrying back to the kitchen to check on her soup. <laughs> so, so, if you use Duolingo to learn English, and this might be unique to the, um, to, like, having it set to Japanese to learn English, because that's, I mean, that's where I've seen it. For some reason, in a certain sentence containing the word soup, like, what is your favorite soup? That's the sentence, right? Um, for some reason, it goes like, what is your favorite soup? <laughs> and if you hover over soup to get it to pronounce just that again, it's just, again, soup. Clearly, she was delighted to have a visitor. Esther felt a little embarrassed, at a loss for how to deal with his unexpected kindness. Speaking of salt, I've still got salt mouth from a bunch of salt and vinegar chips I ate the other day. So I'm gonna need to get a lot of water. Here we are. Eat it while it's warm. Before long, Santa was nudging a bowl of steaming soup into Esther's hands. Filled to the brim with brightly colored vegetables and dark broth. It had a delectable scent rich with herbs and spices. Thank you.
That lovely old man and woman who take care of the house even offered to feed us, but you turned them down, you rude little rent wench. Oh, I probably would have had some of the soup if it weren't poisoned. Poisoned? Yeah, it looked pretty good, too. It's a shame it'll kill you. <laughs> That's from Kodelka. That's my second soup story. You don't need to thank me. There's plenty more in the pot if you're still hungry, so don't be shy. The third one... <laughs> Is all of the, uh, the forever stews, or whatever, the eternal stews, that are in, uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance. That are about probably half of what you'll ever eat in, uh, in that game, because it's, it's just always available. Henry loves his stew. Oh, Henry's here, guys. Oh, that reminds me. I have to clean the stove before my lamp goes out. I'll be right back. And then she was gone again, her light footsteps pattering over to the kitchen. As uh, as Esther er, adverbly ate her supper, she could see Sana's figure darting back and forth, sipping a bowl of soup with one hand while she scrubbed the stove with her other. At first, Esther found it almost impossible to believe, a small girl like Sana living by herself in the wilderness, taking care of the whole manor. But from the natural, precocious way she seemed to handle everything, it didn't take long to realize she was in her element. Who let this precocious child in here? Most of the older girls and boys from the city wouldn't be able to last a week out here without access to any of the normal comforts they took for granted. Yeah, when... When does this take place? <laughs> like, horse and carriage is still the modus operandi of travel. But, like, this house looks appropriate for such an era. And yet, even while she... Whilst she toiled to be... Whilst to div she toiled to beat the dwindling lamplight in her kitchen. Sana looked as contented as a buzzing bee in a field of flowers. Are bees contented? Have they found Nirvana? Phew! A few minutes after Esther finished her meal, Sana wandered back into the parlor wearing a satisfied smile. Satisfied. Kitchen is clean and you've eaten. I hope the fire got you nice and warm, too. It did. Thank you, again, for taking care of me. Oh, please, don't worry about it. Really, Esther. Actually, she gave a tiny, sheepish laugh, her pale cheeks turning slightly pink. Woof! Oh, that one's thick with the adjectives and adverbs. Or just adjectives, I guess. I already cleaned the stove yesterday, but I was so excited and nervous for meeting you that I had to calm down a little bit. Cleaning always makes me calmer, so I'm glad I have a big house like this. It always gives me lots to do. I'm sure the house is glad to have you too. Ha 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 ha! I really hope so. Beaming brightly, Sayna flopped down on the cushions beside Esther, Esther, dangling her legs over the sofa's edge. A kicker, a kicker, a kicker. Another short, awkward pause soon followed. Sana fidgeted a little, staring at the fireplace intently, as if she were too shy to start up the conversation again. After a hesitant pause, Esther decided to finally break the silence. She had to ask the question that had burned her mind from the moment they'd met. Sana. Are you the apothecary that lives in these woods? Esther's words made Sana abruptly stiffen. Where, where did you hear about an apothecary? In one of the towns nearby. People said there was a hermit living out here, an apothecary who used to live in the city. Semicolon. Somebody who found a cure for the pale. All of Sana's cheerful energy seemed to slowly dissipate. Her gaze drifted down to the floor, lingering as if anchored by a heavy weight. So you want more soup? <laughs> I'm sorry, Esther. The apothecary. It's not me. It's... Sana grabbed the fabric of her dress, squeezing it tightly. It was my father. 
It's true that he had the pail, and he managed his symptoms for a while. But he died six years ago. Just like that, disappointment shattered Esther's heart. But even more accurately, she felt a sudden pang of sympathy for Sena. How it must have felt to lose her father so young, living all alone in this deep forest. I'm sorry. I have to get some water already. Be right back. But she offered no other reply, and stayed unusually silent, swallowing hard once or twice. I, I, I don't know, they've both been pretty quiet. What's what's her usual noise level? I, I just... The, the adjectives, man. They get under my skin a little bit. I'll leave tomorrow morning, then. There's no reason for me to cause you any more trouble. Useless child. Y you you could stay here. What? She stared at Zena in surprise, taken aback by the girl's sudden interjection. I mean, stay here to look at Papa's research. He has a lot of papers and books in his study, and journals too, although he told me never to look at them. That's where the naughty things are. But Papa has spent a lot of time working, and I know he took notes about the pail. So if you stay and read through them, you might find something about the cure, right? Her voice quivering slightly, Sana turned to gaze at Esther with a hopeful, eager smile. If you take all the adjectives out, that's like 10,000 words gone. Thank you, but... I don't want to stay here and be a burden. Oh, Esther, you'd never be a burden. You barely ate anything, and you're so quiet and kind. Really, why don't you stay? Please, God, I have literally not seen a human for six years. Do whatever the fuck you want. Esther gave her a hesitant look. That's... <laughs> you heard of arrested development? I got executed development. As much as she wanted to accept Sana's kind offer, it just didn't seem right. After all, Sana obviously worked hard to take care of this place. But Esther didn't have any way to repay her hospitality. Well, if you're going to be very stubborn about it, you can help out with the chores during the day and look over Papa's research after. As if she'd easily guessed the source of Esther's reluctance, Sana gave her a reassuring, cheerful nod. I have a lot of food and wood stored from the winter still. Anyway, so it's really fine. Please don't worry about it. Esther, Esther studied Sana's expression. Those sh shining eyes that were all but begging her to stay. At least if she helped out with the work, she'd feel better about spending a week or two here. Even if it still stuck her, struck her as taking advantage of Sana's loneliness. Alright. You sure I won't be burdening you? Yes, yes! Yes, I'm positively, absolutely... Halfway through her delighted cry, Sana suddenly cut herself off with a gasp. Oh, oh, I forgot. Right, the, the monsters. Oh, you, you have it, right? The pail. Esther nodded, puzzled at Sena's sudden question. I won't ask you to do any chores then. That wouldn't be fair. Papa told me how awful it always made him feel. He couldn't even get out of bed some days. It must be terrible, being so drained all the time, no matter how much you rest. It's fine. I can work. Eh? 
But, to be honest, the longer I don't do anything, the worse I feel. It's hard to push myself, but it's better than when I don't. It was Sanus' turn to hesitate, but Esther offered a small, determined smile to reassure her it was all right. She hated when people pitied her or went easy on her. It bothered Esther even more than the symptoms themselves. If you're sure, then... You know yourself better than I do. It's true. She giggled, clearly overjoyed that Esther had agreed not to leave. Then it's a deal. You'll stay and go over Papa's research and help me out with work during the day. After a brief pause, Esther suddenly dipped her head in silent agreement. We'll start tomorrow, then. Ah, I'm so excited! It's the smile, the contented smile! I can show you the well, the gardens, the stream, the cemetery. <laughs> what, what would you like to drink? We have water, milk, cola, spiders, juice. Spiders, spiders it is, then. We can pick flowers and have a picnic and read by the fireplace and... She trailed off, biting her lip with a dawning look of embarrassment. Um, I'm sorry. I got a bit. I get a bit carried away sometimes. It's all right. You know that it's the whole no human contact for six years really fucks with me. For a long pause, they were both silent again, but the pause was warmer. Gentler, like one between friends. The fireplace's soft crackling echoed in the parlor, a comfort against the howling wind outside. Well, you're probably exhausted, aren't you? Do you hear that? It's the howling wind. Awooga! It's really annoying. Awooga! Why don't you sleep here by the fire? I can bring more blankets so that you have a good night's rest. I think I have enough blankets. Esther mumbled, still cocooned in the numerous woolly sheets Lena had wrapped around her earlier. What to do when you find a, a sad visual novel protagonist? Wrap them in burrito. You may say that now, but you can never have too many blankets. It gets quite drafty in here at night. Huddling a little deeper into the warm covers, Esther offered Sana a small grateful smile. Well, if you need me for anything, my room is upstairs, next to Papa's office. I'm quite tired, too, so I think I'll head off to sleep. With a lengthy yawn, Sana stretched her arms over her head, then hopped up to her feet. The darkness clouding her features earlier had all but vanished, and now she beamed as radiantly as the sun. Good night, Esther. I hope you have wonderful dreams. Good night, Sana. Thank you, really. Esther gave, or she gave Esther a long, heartfelt smile, one that seemed wise and peaceful beyond her years, somehow. While she's got a contented smile, a gentle smile, and a heartfelt smile. This little s smile salesman. After that last look, Sana finally turned away, her light footfalls pattering towards the stairs. Only light footfalls, though. And footsteps. Esther watched her go, listening in something of a daze until she heard the bedroom door softly click shut. I softly opened the door. The past hour almost felt like a dream itself, and Esther half expected to awaken by a shoddy campfire at any moment. Her hopes for finding a cure had been dashed, rekindled, dashed, and rekindled once more. And now she was reluctant to let her expectations run too high. She could stay here for a little while, going through the apothecary's research in search of any clues, but there was no guarantee she'd find anything of use. She has all the smiles. Still, it was the only thing she had to go on. And if there was a chance she wouldn't return home empty-handed, then it was worth giving it a try. And Sena. What a strange, remarkable girl. She'd survived out here alone for six years, suffered the death of her father, and yet somehow still man remained as buoyant as a feather. Esther found it hard to not be deeply curious about her, and envious of all of her whirlwind energy and excitement. It reminded her of a time not so long ago. Back when she used to be like Sena. With a quiet sigh, Esther reached down into her satchel and found a flashback. Before she slept, there was one thing she had to do. Just like every night. 
Cat drugs. Oh, no, not cat drugs. Slowly, yes, they pulled out a fine silver pocket watch. It's thin hands marking the time. It's fat hands just gave you the finger. But when she pressed on one of its buttons, the back abruptly popped open, revealing a tiny glistening switch. Cat drugs! With a practice motion, she jabbed the needle straight into her arm. It stung even more than usual. As the seconds passed, Esther watched her blood slowly filter up through the syringe and into the watch's mechanisms. Then, after a long few moments, the flow stopped, and the blood reversed its course, oozing downward back into her body. As she returned beneath Esther's, as it returned beneath Esther's flesh, a dark circle slowly spread around and around the pierced spot. Magic dialysis? She kept her focus on the watch's face. Two, five, eight. The hour hand started swirling forward. Ten, fourteen, eighteen. Twenty-four. Click. The last drops pushed into her vein. Yeah. Wincing, Esther pulled the needle free, closing the watch with a hasty squeeze of her palm. This medicine of hers... A marvel of technology, they called it. But Esther hated the needle far more than drinking the normal tonic. It, if only it was easier to bring the ingredients with her everywhere. Right now, she didn't have much choice beyond the watch, which injected a potent version of the remedy into her veins once a day. And yet, despite her reliance on the watch, or maybe because of it, Esther longed to be able to cast the twisted thing into a fire like the one before her now. Dropping the watch back into her satchel, she curled up tightly beneath the blankets. The parlor felt colder and less cozy now that she was alone again. But as she closed her eyes, all of Esther's exhaustion caught up with her at once, weighing down her body like a heavy sheet. You're gonna make me yawn again, game. Before long, the crackle of the fireplace lulled her to sleep, sheltering from the cold night outside and all of her restless thoughts gave way to some deep darkness. Within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within... I'll do it until you make words. Within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within darkness, within darkness. Another day of rain. Not a strong storm, but a steady one, quietly smothering the house in a downpour that had seemingly lasted for weeks. Dark, heavy drops sluggishly coursed down the window pane, forming jagged patterns that soon dissolved into nothingness. His gaze followed their ambling paths, watching them aimlessly and without pleasure. But there was nothing else to look at. No impulse to pull him out of this empty staring and into something, anything that would serve more of a purpose. Blurg. How long had he been standing here? Bizarrely, he couldn't remember. Had it been minutes? Hours? Was it morning? Evening? How is it possible to tell when the clouds blurred all sense of light and time? It was only her occasional visits that separated the days for him. That soft, timid, infuriatingly insistent knocking. A reminder that she'd left a tray of food outside his locked bedroom door. Always followed by an uncertain voice calling out for him. Then a long pause before finally her soft footsteps padded away down the stairs. It must be Sana! She's got the soft footsteps! Little wretch. He whispered flatly into his reflection, which only stared back at him with gray irises. He'd hold himself in here to be away from both them and her. Away from her constant smiling, her laughter, the boundless energy that seemed to be mocking him for his pathetic state. That twisted, ungrateful creature. He should have believed his instincts about her from the very beginning. With an immense, painful effort, he pulled himself away from the window. Leaning on this splintered cane, the man staggered toward the bed, where he collapsed onto the sheets like a puppet with severed strings. Towards count four. As he curled into a fetal huddle and hugged his arms around his body, he ran his fingers across the sickly protrusion of ribs pressing against his skin, sharp bones contained by only a thin layer of flesh. If he held himself like this, he could feel the hard, slow, arrhythmic beating of his heart. The tightness in his chest made it difficult to breathe deeply, and so his inhales were shallow and jagged. 
Was it anxiety, his health, or worrying about his health that made his ribcage feel like it was always being crushed? He rolled over to his right side, closing his eyes, trying desperately to ignore the uneven, uneven pounding in his chest. Trying to breathe deeply to calm himself down. To reassure himself that he still deserved to live. Doing everything. Dova. Whip cracking. Gamma. This definitely has pretty good production values for a visual novel made by two people. Like, the art's nice, the presentation is professional, that sort of thing. As you may have noticed from previous visual novel games, that's not a given. A lovely smell! Like herbs and flowers. Sweet, delicate, and earthy. As Esther slowly forced her eyelids open, the pleasant scent greeted her with the morning sun. She blinked around in confusion. This unfamiliar place. Was she dreaming? What kind of place had she awoken in? But as her mind dispelled its haze of sleep, the previous night's events came drifting back to her. The forest, the manor, Sena. All of it was real. Nyeh! Esther dragged herself up into a sitting position, rubbing at her eyes with one hand. Then her gaze drifted down to the floor, where a small mug sat by her feet. Curious, she bent down to pick it up, and realized she'd been smelling the fragrant tea inside as I tried to shimmy in my chair. After one sip of the warm drink, she felt instantly refreshed. It was like filling her lungs with cool, crisp morning air, restorative that washed through her clen and cleansed her system. F.K. In the coffee. Clear as a crisp spring morning. Isn't that right, Zach? Oops. Accidentally clicked on a button on OBS. Hopefully that didn't cause anything weird to happen. It looks okay. Is it really alright to ask her that? I don't want to push her. She just looks so tired. Ah, uh, I don't know. A soft muttering caught Esther's attention. Glancing over her shoulder, she saw Sena sweeping the floor with a thoughtful expression lost in whatever she was contemplating. If only you didn't hate visitors, Papa. I really could could have used your advice. Sana shook her head, sighing wistfully. Oh, you're awake. Suddenly noticing Esther's gaze, she let out a soft gasp and hurried over to the couch. Her features quickly brightening into a smile. But which kind? With both of her hands, Sena clutched a broom that had to be twice her size, although she didn't look encumbered by it at all. She took the pack rat perk. Hello, Sena. Thank you for the tea. Oh, it's nothing. I hope it hasn't gotten too cold. I can make you a fresh pot if you'd like. It's fine. You don't have to do that. Ah. You don't like other people doing things for you, do you, Esther? I'm sorry. I'll try to be better about it. Esther averted her gaze, somewhat embarrassed by Sena's keen observation and apology. Have you been cleaning since you got up? I didn't hear you at all. Clearing her throat, she swiftly changed the subject. Yes, I have! There's a lot to clean in this big, lovely house, so I need to do a little every morning and evening. Trying to get comfortable for the long sit. 
You must clean really well. It's like there's a maid living here. Oh, really? A happy flush rose to Sana's cheeks, and she bounced on her toes a little. Well, it's not a chore or anything. I love cleaning, actually. Papa worked really hard to repair the house and make it pretty. It was a lot easier to clean when he was here, though. Some of the rooms are a little run down, and I don't use them, so I don't dust those as much. But I try my best to take care of the others, even if it's not perfect. Her smile wilted slightly, as if she was disappointed in herself for not keeping the entire house pristine. It's still amazing. Even if I loved cleaning, I couldn't care for this whole place alone. Of course you could, Esther. Sana responded without missing a beat, giving a determined nod and tapping her broom on the floor. Anyone can do anything. Anything they really want to do, that is. They just have to figure out what way is best for them. The other girl's confidence caught Esther off guard. She didn't seem to have a single cynical bone in her whole body. Ah, but anyway, I do hope you slept well. I'm sure you must have been very tired. I could see it in your eyes. They were so shadowed. A hint of concern crept into Sana's voice as she studied Esther's face closely. You do look a little better today, though. Not as gloomy. After you finish your tea, shall we go take care of the grounds together? If you're feeling up to it, I mean. I am, yes. And it's the least I could do to repay you. Esther. Sana seemed like she was about to remind her that there was no need to repay anything, and Esther was taking this all far too seriously. Esther was quite used to hearing that response, despite the fact that nobody ever seemed to really mean it. Whatever makes you the most happy, that's what a good hostess would say, I think. Just don't overwork yourself, alright? I feel like you're stubborn enough to keep going... <sighs> going until you faint. Alright. After beaming at Esther's... And After beaming at Esther encouragingly, Sana hoisted her broom up and cleared her throat. Alright, I'll go finish sweeping the kitchen while you drink your tea. Then we'll go out. Oh, it's such a lovely day. I can't wait to show you around. Ah, I'm so excited. With a delighted sigh, she rushed over to the kitchen. Towards the kitchen. Her towards count five. Her broom swirling across the floor in a flurry of motion. What a peculiar girl she was. I hate that word peculiar. Peculiar. It always gets stuck in me. I never pronounce it right. Maybe it was to be expected, considering she'd lived all alone for so long. Nobody was forcing her to try and fit in with normal society, bottom text. For that reason, Esther couldn't really get a grasp on her behavior or her personality. All that, and, uh, and that made her all the more curious about the story behind Sana's unusual situation. As she finished her tea, Esther made her way to the manor's entrance. Sena, who was already eagerly awaiting for her, led the way out into the fresh morning air. As Esther's gaze drifted up to the radiant blue sky, it almost felt like she had been transported to a different forest. The dark, oppressive atmosphere of the previous night had vanished, transforming once more into a fairy tale shimmer. And with Sena's company, the woods didn't seem quite so vast and daunting, or as lonely for that matter. All right, we're off to the well first. Reaching down beside the front door, Sena picked up two buckets from beneath a protective cloth. Although both were decently sized, one was smaller and looked less professionally made, as if an amateur had crafted it. After a brief pause, the amateur held the larger bucket out to Esther. In that moment of hesitation, her gaze misted over with a distant look. Shall we? She reached out to take Esther's free hand with her own, holding it gently. It seemed like a subconscious movement, as if Sana hadn't even realized she'd done it. The sudden warmth of these lightly calloused fingers caused, caught Esther off guard. Normally, she always disliked being touched. But curiously enough, Sana's delicate grasp didn't give her the same sense of discomfort. Yes, let's go. 
Zaynay gave her a soft, contented smile, although it seemed more melancholy than usual. As unexpected sadness briefly tugged at Esther's chest, and she had had the odd sense she had the odd sense she'd glimpsed at something she shouldn't have. Hand in hand, they wandered across the manor grounds, heading for the well out by the garden. Neither of them spoke. Only the sound of birdsong and their light footsteps in the leaves filled the air. It seemed strange to Sa for Sana to be so quiet, but Esther was a little relieved too. She didn't feel any pressure to speak. Briefly, she wondered if Sana had completely lost herself in thought, perhaps even forgetting Esther's presence. But as if she could somehow read Esther's mind, Sana glanced over towards her, towards Count Six. The smile on her face had grown contented once more, the traces of sadness drying up beneath the warm sunlight. This game's making me sleepy. As they stepped up to the well, Sana came to a halt. It's like comfy, you know. I'll let you go first if you like. She look, turned to look at Esther expectantly, tilting her head to one side. Nodding, Esther turned towards the well, towards Count Seven, scanning it over hastily. It had to be quite simple, surely. All she needed was to tie the rope to the bucket. That was it, right? Surely she could just lower it down afterwards. She wasn't very good at tying knots, though. Wouldn't? What if it couldn't hold the water's weight, and she lost Sana's bucket down the well? Esther realized the other girl was watching her closely, eyes widening in realization. Have you ever drawn water from a well, Esther? Stricken with a sudden sense of self-consciousness, Esther shook her head. S-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-
water cheerfully splashing with each step. Despite saying a small frame, she carried her full bucket with little effort. Years of solitary labor must have given her strength to belied her size. Esther felt her arms already getting slightly sore from the heavy weight, but she made a determined effort to not show any trace of discomfort in front of Sena. Here we are, Esther. My garden. What do you think? As they came to a stop among the rows of neatly planted crops, Sena swiveled around to look up at Esther eagerly. I can't believe you do all of this alone. It's so pretty and well kept. Y you really think so? Esther nodded, her gaze drifting across the diverse, meticulously cared for vegetables and leafy greens with admiration. Leafy greens don't count as vegetables now. Well, actually, Papa was the one who made the first garden patch here. He wanted to live off what he could grow and forage for himself because he hated relying on other people. I only saw him visit the city a few times a year. He taught me how to do everything by myself, too. Well, not everything, but he did write an almanac and a foraging book, and he made them really easy to understand just for me. So as long as the earth is still alive, I know I'll be alright. How to Not Die 101 Humming contentedly to herself, Sena led the way to over to a large watering can that sat near a row of peas. Once she'd empty, emptied her bucket into the can, she traded the empty vessel with Esther, a convenient way to hold plucked weeds. Th luckily for Esther, weeding wasn't a task that needed much instruction. It didn't take long for them to settle into a comfortable pace together, with Sena watering and fussing over her crops while Esther pulled out unwanted sprouts. Although gardening never really appealed to her before, it surprised Esther how relaxing it was to work with her hands like this. Working side by side helped diminish the awkwardness that still lingered between them as well, and before long, Esther felt comfortable enough to break the silence with a question. Do you ever get nervous when it grows colder? In case there isn't enough food to last you until spring, I mean. Oh no, not really. Some plants grow all the way through winter, and things like potatoes will last for a while in my pantry. You can dry out berries and mushroom, and nuts are always good too. There are a lot growing around here, so I never run out of those. Motioning towards some sh towards count nine, towards some shrubs at the end of edge of the clearing, Sena hefted her watering can with a light grunt before she continued. Actually, I think it's quite fun when a new season comes along. It means I can plant new foods and make new recipes. I'd really miss winter if it never came, even if the house does get icy cold. Icy cold? Isn't it cozy by the fireplace as long as you're covered in blankets? It's a little bit drafty still, but with some hot tea, it's perfect. Oh, that reminds me. I have to show you my winter recipe book sometime. I'm making a new spring one since I've been trying a lot of different things. And there are, re are really so am many amazing combinations you can have with just... With a small smile warming her face, Esther listened as Sena began recounting tales of her recent cooking and foraging adventures. It felt so calm and comfortable somehow. Perhaps Sena had noticed how little Esther liked to speak, so instead of asking too many questions, she lightly chattered away about lettuce and peas, her voice filling the silence like the bubbling of a stream. <sighs> after, they'd <laughs> after they'd finished weeding and watering, they brought her their empty pails and a few small trowels to venture outside the clearing. Eager to share her knowledge, Sena guided Esther to the best foraging spot she'd found, pointing out which berries, nuts, and wild greens go were best to gather. The more that Esther learned, the less harsh and daunting the forest appeared. Surviving in the wild always struck her as a daunting task. Daunting twice. But Zena's simple, cheerful explanations made it seem like something anyone could accomplish, as long as they put in enough effort. None of this seemed like work for Zena either. It was almost like they were just playing together instead. Esther couldn't help but envy her energy and enthusiasm, the way she managed to take so much joy from everything. And yet at certain moments there was something unusually determined and purposeful about her effervescent happiness. As if it were another method of survival, just like her gardening and foraging were. Ah, the sun's so bright today. Oh look, it's already a bit past midday. Time's been flying much faster than it normally does. 
All this work made me really hungry. Are you hungry, Esther? A little bit. She forced her words to sound nonchalant, but in reality, Esther was just as famished. Normally she had to force herself to eat or simply forgot about it at all, but not today. Is that your stomach growling? No, it was probably just the wind. Oh, alright then. Is the wind hungry? Well, if you wait for me on the little log near the garden, I'll bring back some food for us. I'll just be a few minutes, I promise. Meet you there. Twirling around, she bounded off in the direction of the manor, her hair fluttering wildly in the wind. Her constant energy never fails, failed to amaze Esther. Already, she could feel a familiar deep fatigue weighing on her own shoulders, as much as Sana's presence had helped distract her from it. But she was determined not to succumb to the feeling today. There was too much left for her to do. Following Sana's footsteps back towards the, towards count ten, towards the clearing, Esther made her way toward towards count eleven. We got a double baby. Woo! Towards the fallen log near the garden patch. Before long, Sana's small figure trotted back into view, a little splash of white and pink flitting across the grass. After stopping briefly at the well, she approached Esther's chosen picnic spot with a careful with careful steps, balancing two bowls on one arm while car whilst whilst carrying a bucket of fresh water in the other. Here we are. I just made something small and quick, but it should give us the energy enough to finish the today's chores. Beaming proudly, she offered Esther one of the bowls. It held a hearty salad topped with lentils and various seeds, a red berry glaze glistening on the leaves. Tucked into each bowl was a generous slice of warm bread, lightly toasted from the stove. Thank you. It looks delicious. Ah, uh, it's really nothing. But my baby lettuces will be so happy to hear that. They always like a bit of encouragement. You talk to your lettuces? Mm-hmm. I usually chatter with all my plants, or maybe you forgot the fact that I'm crushingly lonely. Like, holy shit, I'm lonely. They were my the only friends I really had before you came here. With that slightly quieter, more subdued statement, Sena settled down beside her on the log. At first, Esther felt slightly awkward, caught in the wake of Sana's earnest words with no idea how to reply. But once the smaller girl took a bite of the salad and started to munch away, Esther followed suit, her mood instantly lifting from the sweet berry flavor that filled her mouth. They took turns using a ladle to sip the water that Sana brought, its crisp coolness as refreshing as the morning breeze. Although they didn't exchange any words while eating, the atmosphere between them gradually settled into something calm and comfortable. Now and then, Sana would glance over at Esther, offering a little smile as soon as they made eye contact. She seemed happy just to be able to share a meal together. Yeah, you can use space bar. In a way, Esther could understand why. Normally, she preferred to eat alone. Other people made her feel self-conscious about her shyness, or the way she ate her food. But somehow, Sana's quiet company didn't bother her. Now that they were a little more familiar with each other, perhaps the little girl didn't feel like she needed to constantly fill the silence all the time. Once they'd finished eating, the two girls made a brief return to the manor. Despite Sana's protests, Esther stub stubbornly insisted on washing up their dishes. Her pride refused to let the younger girl handle everything, even if Sana was probably far more capable at it. Yeah, how much younger, by the way? <laughs> Flirty hand-holding. Pre-marital hand-holders. Here you are, Esther. When they reunited outside, Sana handed her a large, sturdy broom, even bigger than the one she'd been using earlier. Just like with the bucket, she held a second broom that was smaller and more suited to her size. The broom was far heavier than Esther expected. It had the slightly dusty, preserved look of something that had sat unused for years, but hadn't been forgotten. Ah, uh, I know we've already done a lot today, so if you need to rest, just tell me, please. Thank you. But I'm fine. I can keep working. All right, but you can always stop whenever you need to. Through Sena's gentle smile, Esther thought she could detect a hint of worry. 
It was more than a little unexpected, considering they'd only just met each other yesterday. The place we're heading in a few minute is a few minutes' walk from the manor. Let's go, shall we? Motioning for Esther to follow, Sana set off eagerly into the woods. Her excitement must have hastened her steps, for Esther suddenly had trouble keeping up with her lively pace. They hurried along a slender, winding path, and the manor's statuesque presence soon disappeared among the branches. So at what point does, uh, does Sana lead Esther to, like, a shrine of human sacrifice or something? When does the shoe drop? Once it did, Esther found herself swiftly losing all sense of direction among the sea of vibrant leaves. She was so thoroughly glad she had Sana to guide her. Otherwise, it seemed unlikely she'd ever find her way back. Here we are. A short while later, they emerged into a less densely wooded area. At first, Esther thought she was imagining things. But when she looked more closely, she realized she was seeing exactly what she thought. A serene, beautiful graveyard captured in the golden sunlight, like a forgotten relic lost to time. Rows upon rows of headstones stood between the trees, each one a different shape and size. But despite their obvious age, and the fact that they were nestled in the woods instead of a proper clearing, every grave looked incredibly clean. It gave the cemetery a strange, ethereal atmosphere, with the same awe and reverence that surrounded mythical artifacts at a museum. This is where I keep all the bodies. You'll be joining them soon. Not far in the distance, a large mausoleum rose upon the shore of the graveyard's pond, casting a somber reflection across the water. It caught Esther's eye, and for a moment she found herself mesmerized by its towering presence. I'm gonna crack my back. No, oh, it's not working. Yeah. Are you looking at the mausoleum? It's locked, I'm afraid. I've looked all over the manor and the grounds, but I don't think I'll ever find the key. Papa must have lost it. Oh, you mean this key? Santa offered a small, wistful smile. Smile tap number five. Let's go. Shaking her head. Esther pulled her focus back to the other girl, blinking. Felt like something strange had come over her briefly, but she had no idea what it was. Why do you tend to this place so closely? Is your... Is anyone you know buried here? No, I don't know any of them. To Esther's surprise, Shana, Sana shook her head. It seemed far too insensitive to ask where Sana's father was buried if he wasn't in the graveyard, so Esther bit her lip and let the other girl continue. Actually, I don't really know who's buried here. Papa never gave me much of an answer. But since the manor belonged to his family, the cemetery is probably for old relatives. All the graves seem like they've been here for a very long time. As her gaze drifted across the headstone, Santa's expression grew a little more distant again. I don't know why, but I've always been drawn here, ever since I was a little girl. It felt so peaceful. Lonely, but peaceful, and, uh, and comforting in a strange way. Like a place that will always be here. Always the same, as long as I take care of it. Her words trailed off slowly, ending in a little more than a whisper that faded into the breeze. But only a few lingering seconds passed before Sana seemed to catch herself, blinking and restoring a brighter smile to her face. Well, let me show you what I usually do here. It's an easy chore and very calming. I think you'll like it. It was impossible to just ignore the brief moments that came over Sana, for it seemed like she wasn't aware of Esther's presence at all. But then again, after being alone for so long, it was only natural that she'd fall back into her own thoughts now and then. I'm ready. With these brooms, uh, sweeping is involved somehow, I assume. It is. What a clever guess. Come, come. I always start over here, in the Northwest Patch. Gently taking Esther's hand, Sayna led her over to the first row of graves. 
She demonstrated how she cleared each headstone of stray leaves and surrounding weeds, and once or twice a week picked little bunches of flowers to rest beside the markers. Like Santa had said before, the task was easy and calming. Despite her initial hesitance, Esther soon found herself enjoying how peaceful the cemetery felt, and honoring the dead certainly seemed like a worthwhile effort. Yet despite her soothing lull in thoughts that it afforded her, and the secluded beauty that surrounded them, Esther couldn't shake a sense of uneasiness that tinkled at every nape of her neck. A sense that they were not alone in the cemetery. It was completely irrational, and she couldn't explain it no matter how hard she tried. But even in the daytime, with the sun's gentle afternoon rays filtering through the trees, something about the graveyard shadows struck her as particularly haunting. As the evening began to slowly settle over the forest, the two girls made their way back to the manor. Despite her tiredness, Esther's heart leapt at the prospect of finally beginning her research once they arrived. And true to her promise, Sena took Esther straight up to her father's study. By the time they arrived, however, the towering bookshelves blocked out most of the remaining sunlight, so they had to fetch a few candles to alleviate the gloom. According to Sena, she used such light sources sparingly, as non-wood fuel was difficult to stockpile. Luckily, there were a few types of shrubs and trees in the forest that she could extract wax from, as well as seeds and nuts that could be crushed for oil. I feel like this bit was added late, that, or like a afterwards, uh, as some parts of this other, some other parts of the scene, because it's like, okay, they arrive back late. It's dark. We get candles out. Shit, where does she get the candles from? But since Esther was a special guest, Sena reassured her that she could light as many candles as needed during her stay. Ah. It feels like so long since I've seen any candlelight in this room. Well, it has been quite long, I suppose. The last time was when Papa was still around. Setting a newly lit candle down on the desk, Sena let out a quiet sigh. Sena, your father. I've been meaning to ask. What is his name? Oh, his name was Isaiah. It's so strange to say it out loud, since I never called him that. I only heard someone use his name once, back when I was very small. She fiddled with the hem of her dress, her gaze drifting away from Esther's. Ah, uh, I'm sorry about the mess in here. All the loose papers will probably make it hard for you to find what you're looking for. Papa never liked to throw things away, especially not his letters, not even his little scribbles or notes. You can read any of them you like, but I... Well, Papa always told me not to peep at his writings, so even now I try to leave them as they are. You probably think I'm very silly for it, I'm sure. I can help you with anything else, though. Would you like me to sort out the books, maybe? No, it's all right. You've been very kind to me already. I don't want to push you any further. Her words were quiet and gentle, but firm. She didn't want to take advantage of Sana's generosity. And although she'd never mentioned it directly, Esther also needed some time alone. Ah. All right, then. I'll leave you to it. If you need me, I'll be in the kitchen fixing up dinner. You can come down whenever you're ready. Beaming at Esther encouragingly, she turned towards the door, towards Count Eleven, Lifting her hand in a little wave. Or is it 12? I've already lost count. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. Normally I would go longer. But all the salt mouth I've got from those chips made it. Made me talking like. <laughs> harder than usual. So I'm going to stop it here today. We'll find out what she finds in the study t next week. And uh, I guess I'm just not feeling up to a, a long stream today. So that, that, that's been a good one. Um, it's been a pretty strong start. There's lots of mystery, lots of... Huh. Um, but the big, my biggest complaint is the adjectives and adverbs. It's so easy to go overboard on them. But definitely when you're writing, try to lean towards... Towards count 12 towards uh going with too few think about the ones that change the meaning of a sentence like if you write a sentence and you notice a lot of or if you write a paragraph and you notice a lot of adjectives mentally take them out in your head and see if the meaning of the sentence changes if it does the adjectives were important and sometimes it does if it only added 
like context or flavor to a set, to a paragraph, you can easily cut down on them. That's something you'll do in editing, not necessarily while you're while you're writing. So there's my little writing tip for, for this time. And uh, let's see what I have for tomorrow. Yeah, this game makes me sleepy. It's just so comfy. Tomorrow's game is Kingdom Ka. I don't remember what that is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a... Uh, it's a walking sim with, like, surreal imagery. One of those, you know. Okay, so... Save... Empty slot. That's it for today. See y'all next time. Simple and concise are almost always the better...